Amen. If you got your Bible with you, get it in your hand, hold it up in the air, repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. It is a light and a lamp and a sword. My strength. It is what it says I am. Boy, I said that backwards. I am <laughs> what it says I am. Did y'all know I, can, I have a hard time sometimes thinking and talking at the same exact time? It happens every once in a while. So we're going to finish it, though. I am no longer a stranger. I'm adopted. A child of the king. Seated with Christ. Right hand of Abba. Faith walking. Word talking. Rapture ready. Hero of faith for this generation. This is my Bible. I am. I am. I am what it says I am. And I want to remind you at Bell's Chapel Assembly of God Church, we are still a lighthouse where the power of God by the right hand of God is ripping men and women out of darkness, bringing them into the light where their lives are being rescued, recovered, and restored forever and forever and forever. That is still who we are. And I want to tell you this started this morning with a new vision that the Lord had dropped on my heart where we are going to love the display and the power of the presence of the living God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. And we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves, which means that when the power of God is moving and on display, we're going to take the time for that power of God to reach into men and women's lives and make a change within them. I know when you look up here that... Somebody help me out just a little. I'm going to get y'all woke up. Now, I know when y'all look up out of you this morning, we don't have a single wheelchair. We don't have a single crutch. We don't have a single pacemaker laying on the stage anywhere. I know when you look up here in the physical realm, you don't see any, any walkers. You don't see any of those things. There's not a pile of eyeglasses over here anywhere. But I want you to know in the spirit realm, we have a great pile of wheelchairs and walkers. And we got crutches and we got the chains and the locks and the prison doors. We've got all of that pile. Up, I wish you could open your eyes in the spirit realm and see the great debris of the enemy that is scattered on the field of battle around this place where God has rescued and recovered and restored and we are going to continue to go for the presence of the living king and see people's lives changed for until, until, the, until the Lord raptures us we're going to pursue his presence and allow him to move in our services. That's the reason we had what we had this morning. That's the reason we saw like we did this morning. The power and the presence of God moving. And I know, I don't, if y'all, if I can just get y'all to catch this popcorn thing going on. I tell you what, when I say I'm having more fun at church that ought to be legal, y'all need to come follow me around for a little while. It's the real deal, guys. I, I, who else in the world gets to have this much fun besides the children of the living king? That's what I want to know. Who else gets to do this besides the children of the living king? With that in mind this morning, this afternoon, I want to talk to you about fathers. That's going to kind of seem like a Father's Day sermon, but maybe not so much this afternoon. Luke chapter 11, verse 22, when Jesus started this, the prayer, he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father. Everybody say, Father. Jesus said unto them, When you begin to pray, I want you to pray this way, Our Father. And I want to know, ask you this question as we're getting started. How many of you really know him as Father? What does that mean? What does it mean to know him as Father? What does that actually mean? What is it entitled that he is our Father? I want to tell you he is God. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is in heaven. He is on the throne. But he is first and foremost. He is your Father. I know we get this thing in our mind about who God is and about where he is. And he's off in the distant eons of space out there somewhere. And maybe he looks to you like a great old man with a long white beard. I don't know what he looks like to you. Maybe he looks like a cloud without form. I don't know. And we get this thing going in our mind about his power and about his presence and about his position in the universe. And we forget this one thing, most important thing you can have in your life. Yes, he's God. Yes, he's omnipresent. Yes, he's omnipotent. Yes, he's omnipowerful. He is all those things but above all else he is your father and I want the enemy is doing everything he can to remove the idea of what does it mean to be a father in this nation the enemy is doing everything he can to remove the idea of what it means to be a father and destroy what real fatherhood is if you look around our nation and look at what's going on in this world all kinds of things are destroying fatherhood lost custody divorce and separation Oftentimes, unfortunately, death sometimes happens. And sometime, quite some time ago, three or four decades ago, 
social programs began to be instituted through our country and through the government that made fatherhood not so important anymore. The federal government began to step in and say, I'll be the father. I'll pay the bills. I'll support the children. I'll put the groceries on the table. You fathers, you'd be better off. Y'all go ahead and just go on down the road, find your department somewhere else. We'll take care of the kids. We'll take care of the ladies. And y'all just go on your way. Drugs and alcohol. Moving into the home, destroying what fathers are supposed to be. And taking away what a father is in a home. And changing what a father is supposed to be. Abuse and abandonment, other regulations. And the government then coming in through the court system. And saying to a father, you only have the right to produce bread in the house. But you don't have a right to discipline in the home. You don't have a right to lead in the home. You're going to do like you're told when you're told. You show up, bring the bread, go back outside and mow the yard. But after that, you're done. Leave the kids alone. I'm still preaching. It's what's happening to fathers. It's what's happening around our nation to fathers. And the enemy is in an onslaught to, to destroy what a father is in the home. If you want some statistics on it, I'll prove it to you. 43% of children right now in the United States of America are living without their father in their home. What's happening in America with fathers? The enemy is coming in and trying to remove the father out of the home through all different avenues, all these different means, trying to destroy the idea of what is a father. 63% of youth, fa youth suicide, no father in the home. 90% of homeless runaways, no father in the home. 85% of child children with behavioral disorders, no father in the home. 71% of high school dropouts, no father in the home. 75% of kids in drug treatment programs, no father in the home. 85% of children incarcerated right now in juvenile detention facilities, no father in the home. Children, women, excuse me, girls with no father in the home, 711% more likely to produce a child as a teenager. Because no father in the homes. Those are current statistics right now. In the United States of America, what's happening? It's an onslaught against fathers. The enemy's doing everything he can to come in and twist the idea of what is a father. What makes a good father? What is a strong father? Why does there need to be a father in the house? I don't need a father. All I need is a, is a mother. I don't need all of that. I don't need that direction. I don't need that leadership. I don't need that guidance. It's a rash of fatherlessness in the nation. The role of the father, uh, the proper development of children in the home is absolutely indispensable in the home. You want to know why there's riots going on in the streets right now? And you want to know why all that's happening after the election with Donald Trump? You want to know why those people marched and why they did all that? There's a thousand different possibilities, but let me throw this out there to you. They don't have a father. They did that because they're scared. What are they afraid of? Because they've been raised in homes without strong fathers. They've been raised around weak fathers, abusive fathers, fathers in abandonment, etc., etc. And the idea of father has become so foreign to them that they don't know what a strong father is. And then a man has been elected who stands up and he says, I'm a strong father figure. I have good children. My children do what I ask them to do. They have followed me. He may not have been morally perfect, but as a father, he's been a good father. And he stood up as a father figure and he said, I'm going to father this nation. And I'm going to make this nation follow me as a good, strong father. And they fell into fear why it wasn't because of his programs it wasn't because of his words it was because he stood up as a father and said I'm going to father this nation and you're going to follow me as a father that's what they were afraid of and the enemy has set out to destroy that idea of father and I want to tell you something listen to me tonight you will never know who you are until you know who your father is I've been saying this for a couple of weeks you will never know who you are until you know who your father is approximately three months ago I was sitting at my breakfast table Everybody else had already gone, to, had gone on to school and to work, and I was sitting there drinking a cup of coffee reading, and I'll never forget in that moment, the Father spoke to me my own self, and He said, you still don't know who you are because you don't know who I am. You still don't know who you are because you still don't know who I am. And from that moment, I began to try to determine who is He as my Father. I was lucky. I had a good father. My dad was at every football game. He was at every bas baseball game. He was always there. He went to work. He came home. He did all of those things that a father is supposed to do. He whipped our tail when it needed whip. Sometimes when it didn't need whip because we missed one. So he got, he got a catch up one. He'd get it when he could, whenever it was necessary. He taught me how to hunt and taught me how to fish. He did all those things a father's supposed to do. I'm, a, I'm one of the lucky ones. I had a father in the home. But not everybody's out there like that. And because of the enemy's onslaught in fathers, we have a broken view of who a father is. Satan is working very hard to taint and to darken and bring distrust 
into the idea of what a father is because if you don't know who your father is, you'll never know who you are. And if it can destroy how you feel about your father, he'll change how you feel about God Father. Are you listening to me? Mark chapter 14, verse 36, the scripture says, And Jesus cried, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. If you go look that up, it, make, it, it appears to us that he says that Jesus cried out, Daddy God. Daddy, Daddy. Father, Abba. Put those two together. That he puts those together, Father, Father. And I want to tell you something. There has to be a difference. Jesus did not have a stuttering problem when he said, Abba, Father. And it's not misrecorded. He couldn't have said, Father, Father, or Abba, Abba. There's two differences there. What is Abba and what is Father? Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, the scripture said, And because you are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. There it is again, the two different words, Abba and Father. It doesn't just mean Daddy, Daddy. And so tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about who is your Father. I'm not talking about your earth Father. I want to talk about your God Father. I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about who your father is. And let me throw this out there. The word father is patar, P-A-T-E-R. And it means father by creation, whether near or far. Father by creation, whether near or far. Most of y'all don't know much about my nativity. I only know the parts I've been told. I don't remember that far back. I'm letting that sink in just a minute. I was a baby, guys. I can't remember that part. Y'all y'all with me, right? Y'all are so quiet tonight. Y'all making me just a little nervous being that quiet. I don't, but I do know this. I do know that when I was conceived, my dad was on his way to Vietnam. He got on an airplane. They sent him all the way across the world to the other side. I was born, and how old was I before you saw me? I was six weeks old before he ever saw me. But guys, you know what? I had a father at conception. He, is a, he was my father whether he was near or whether he was far. I had a father. I had been created. I had a father in that moment. Whether near or far, fatherhood is not created by distance. It is created by relationship. And I had a father. He may have been in Vietnam and I may have been in Atkins, Arkansas, but I still had a father. This term father, I know how many of you used to watch Bill Cosby? There was one episode whenever Theo was trying to act up just a little bit and Bill Cosby looked at him and said, son, I brought you into this earth and I can take you out of this earth. That was a father. That's the, that was the position of father. That may not have been Abba, but that was father. And the world has reduced it. Listen to me. The world has reduced father to a donor of genetic material. The world tried to reduce Father down to just a donor of genetic material. But I want to tell you something. God is so much more than just your Father by creation. And tonight again, I hope to explain just a little bit about what I'm talking about. He is so much more than just your Father by creation. I was praying about this when I've been thinking about this and thinking about this. And I was praying it this way. God, if you are all creative and you are you could he could have chose to do man any way he wanted he could have had a great pile of dirt somewhere and little babies could be crawling out of that pile of dirt him just standing there breathing life into him one after another one after another if he wanted to there could be a tree of life somewhere that an acorn fell out of it when it hit the ground it sprung out and a stork picked up the little baby and brought it to your house God could have done it any way he wanted to there could have been any opportunity for God to have created, and I cried, Father, why does creation happen like it does? In a moment of intimate embrace, coupled by a miracle inside a mother's womb, implanted by the daddy, why is there creation like that? And God whispered down deep inside of me when I was meditating on this. He said, I will tell you why I create, made creation this way. I did it this way for in no other way could I share the joy and the exhilaration of the power of creation with the man that I created. That man might have a glimpse of my heart as their father and as their creator. In that moment, listen, I want to tell you a vision the Lord gave me when I was studying this out. 
I saw in that moment of conception in a flash. All of a sudden I was in a place of darkness and I saw the egg and I saw the sperm and the instant I saw those two come together instantaneously as they touched in that moment of creation I saw the hand of God and it reached out behind that moment of creation at that moment of inception and I saw every ounce of your essence pulled together in the hand of the Father. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 he said I know the thoughts I think of you thoughts of good and not of evil to bring you to an expected end and I saw God pull every ounce of your essence together who you are who you're going to be all your possibilities his hopes his dreams his aspirations for you I saw the moment that those two things touched I saw his hand reached up I saw him take the breath of life and blow your very existence inside of that. Listen to me, I want to tell you something. Cell division can determine how you grew. It can determine why you got blue eyes and whether you're six foot tall or five foot two. But they cannot explain your moral existence and your eternal nature. But I saw your moral existence, your eternal nature, and the spirit of man blown inside that thing. And in that moment, I understood something. I understood that my God is my Father. He didn't just throw some DNA down there on the ground and I didn't just grow up out of from nothing to something but he had a plan for me he pulled me together he knit me inside my mother's womb but he did more than that he had every hope every dream every aspiration for me he blew it inside of me it is why I am what I am tonight Scott turned me up just a little I, he said that's why he's my alpha and my omega it's why he's my beginning my end I saw that in an instant. And as I saw that, listen to me, it gets even better. I know you didn't get to choose your daddy. I didn't get to choose that man sitting right there. He chose me. Do you hear what I just said? I didn't get to choose him. He was about to make a trip and go someplace. And he's going to leave some posterity behind. And he chose me. And I didn't get to choose him. I was born to kill him. I was, that was not my choice. And so many people in this world that say, I didn't get to choose my daddy. My daddy ain't been a good daddy, and I didn't get to choose my daddy. But I want to tell you something. He chose you, and I want to tell you something else. God, you didn't get to choose your existence. I've heard people say, I didn't ask to be born. I didn't choose to be here, and I didn't ask for this. But I want to tell you something. Your God chose you. He knit you together in your mother's womb as a creative force. He picked you out of the air, out of nothing. He designed you. He put your life together in a of his hand. He blew his life into you that you might live. All his hopes, dreams, and aspirations into you. That's who he is. He is God your father. I know you didn't get to choose him, but he chose you out and called you from nothing into something and pulled together who you are. Every hope, every dream, every aspiration. You're looking at that and you're saying, if that be the case, why am I where I am like I am? I done told you there is an enemy out there. And he's trying to destroy the image of the Father in you. But I want to tell you right now, that man sitting right there has never had one ounce of harm for me. He's never thought one evil thought about me. He ain't never done nothing but want the best for me. And he ain't nothing but a piece of what God is. And I want you to know, I don't care where you are, what's going on in your life. I don't care what the enemy has stormed up or brought up. Your God has never had one evil thought about you. He ain't never cast his eye down on you. And he ain't never shoved you aside. He chose you, called you out of nothing. And made you into something. And he has a plan for your life. He is your Alpha and your Omega. Your beginning and your end. While the Lord was giving me all that. He told me, he said, y'all come out in three ways. There goes my clock. Y'all are in trouble now. He told me conception happens three ways. Sometimes conception happens in love. And righteousness. In the bounds of marriage, a husband and wife come together, and a child is produced. I'll never forget whenever my wife came to me the very first time, my firstborn sitting in service with us. And I'll never forget when she came to me and she told me, we're going to have a baby. I'll never forget what happened in that very moment. I went from being Chad Duval to daddy in an instant. All the men, I'm preaching to men right now, the men understand what I'm talking about, the men that have been fathers. In that instant, that union came out with love, with hope, with expectation, with great desire. All of a sudden, there was a great joy and an overwhelming joy that came out of that. And I want to tell you, it fulfilled all the earthly symbolism of what it was supposed to be in the heart of God. But not every time is conception born that way. 
God told me it happens three ways. Number one, sometimes it happens in love, the bounds of righteousness, and sometimes it happens in sin. And the problem that what happens in sin is this is what happens. Life starts out in fear and lust and rejection and tears and imbalance. Whenever a father or whenever a young lady comes to a young man and they're not married and she says to him, I am with child and it's yours. In that moment, there's a shifting and an imbalance that goes on. And what happens in that imbalance is there is instantly fear and rejection. There's denial. I don't want this thing. What have we done? It's an accident. It's a mistake, etc., etc., etc. I know oftentimes the family comes around and finally things get good. But the instant that happens, that moment, it is a, uh, it's an upheaval of what should have been. It's not God's will for it to be that way. The third way it happens oftentimes is in violence. That is never God's will. It has the exact same effect as it has when it's done in unrighteousness. But God told me this. He said it doesn't matter if it happens in righteousness. It doesn't matter if it happens in sin. And it doesn't matter if it happens in righteousness. I attend the creation of all of my creation. I'm there every single conception and every single time. Whether it starts in love and righteousness or whether it starts in violence. Those are my children. I put that seed in there. I blew that. The father standing at the end of the drive. He looks as far as he can see. And there comes a figure he recognizes. Instantaneously nothing else mattered but the boy walking down that road. The scripture says in Luke chapter 15 verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was a great way off. His father saw him. Had compassion on him. And ran and fell on his neck. And kissed him. And in the original Greek, if you go back and look at it, it actually says it this way. He ran to him, he fell upon his neck, and he kissed him and could not stop kissing him. He just simply could not stop kissing him. Stunk like a pig. Slop in his beard. Left with half the goods of the father. And he's come back with nothing but stink. Broke and broken. And the father found him broke and broken. And ran to him pell-mell. Fell on his neck. And just simply could not stop kissing him. Listen to me. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. Your salvation is not lost. Your salvation is not works. You see, your salvation is about the fact that Father found you. He saw you a great way off and had compassion on you. And he ran to you. And he fell upon your neck. And he kissed you. And he just simply cannot stop kissing you today. He simply just cannot stop kissing you. He loves you more than you can even imagine. I want to look at Jesus real quick. We find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26, verse 42. And he's down on his knees and he's prayed until blood, and like great drops of sweat, has appeared on his brow. And he says these words Father, if it be possible, Abba, Abba, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But if not, thy will be done. What did Jesus say? Abba, I have no fear of death. I have no fear of failure. And I have no fear of life. Because I know you as Abba. He arises from that place. You all know the story. Then in Matthew chapter 27 verse 46, I want to show you something. That we've questioned our whole Christian existence. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I will point out something glaringly obvious, but we have missed it. He does not say, Abba, Abba, why have you forsaken me? Please look at it again, my God, my God, why have you 
forsaken me. Why did he say, by God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Stay with me just a second. Because in that moment, Jesus became prodigal. And you'll say to me, Jesus never was prodigal, for Jesus knew no sin. And I will say to you, in that moment, Jesus became prodigal. And he was far, far, far from his father. His father was in heaven, and he was on the earth. Just like the father was at home, and the prodigal was in the pit with the pigs. First, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he had been, was made to be sin for those of us who knew no sin. In that moment, Jesus became prodigal for you but that's not where it stays if we may take one more trip down this same trail Luke chapter 23 verse 46 at the end and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice he said Abba into your hands I commend my spirit I did not, had not ever seen this, but as I was researching this out, I found out that in Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10, 11, 12, and 13, we find God's answer to his call. Listen to this, please. Jesus has just, about to die, has just died on the cross. Cried out, Abba, into your hands I commend my spirit. And this is the response from God. Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter 2. My beloved spake and said unto me, rise up, my love, my fair one. Think about this. Jesus is hanging on a cross. These are the words of Father to Jesus. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, and the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Abba heard the cry of the one dying on the cross. Arise, my love, and come away. Your work on earth is done. Arise. In that moment, if you would with me in your mind, imagine there stands Father on the portal of heaven. He has just called, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come to me. And he looks, and there stands a form that he recognized, pierced, beaten, bloodied, broken, a mess. And he rushes down the hallway of eternity and falls on the neck of Jesus and kisses him and just simply can't stop kissing him. I will remind you that that is you. Jesus is looking right this minute down the hallway of eternity. And he sees you at the end of that aisle. Bloodied, broken. A mess. And he has rushed across down that hallway of eternity. And he has fallen on your neck today. And he is kissing you. And just simply cannot stop. I'll go back to where I started. Some of you here, you have struggled with your salvation. Because salvation has, been, has turned into law and not grace. Don't, can't. Can't go here, can't go there, can't do this, can't do that. Got to read, got to pray, got to study, got to read, got to pray, got to study. Now I'm under condemnation because I didn't pray, I didn't read, I didn't study. I just can't be good enough. I just can't be good enough. So all of a sudden, salvation has become a weight I cannot carry, a stone upon my back. I wish I didn't even have to do it this way, but God's the boss, so I don't want to go to hell, so I'll just do it. And your salvation has become a burden and not a pleasure. It has driven joy far from you. But I want to tell you something. Today, Father is pursuing you. He's ran down that hallway of eternity. He's fallen on your neck. And he simply cannot stop kissing you. I've got a video that we're going to play that, for my altar call. It's about 3 minutes and 43 seconds long. And at the end of it, if you're here today, I'm not saying you're backslid. I am not saying you're backslid. But I'm saying salvation has turned into a weight and you can barely bear. And you need to not just know him as father distant, but you need to know him as Abba. In three minutes and 43 seconds, I want you to come to this altar and picture him falling on your neck, kissing you, and just simply can't stop. Play the video for us. In a little chapel. 
in the Allegheny Mountains of Western Pennsylvania. And then literally the thousands of hours of prayer, meditation, silence, and solitude over those years, I am now utterly convinced that on Judgment Day, the Lord Jesus is gonna ask each of us one question and only one question. Did you believe that I loved you? That I desired you? That I waited for you day after day? That I longed to hear the sound of your voice? The real believers there will answer, yes, Jesus. I believe in your love and I tried to shape my life as a response to it. But many of us who are so faithful in our ministry, in our practice, in our church going, are gonna have to reply, <clears throat> well, frankly, no, sir. I mean, I never really believed it. I mean, I heard a wonderful, a lot of wonderful sermons and teachings about it. In fact, I gave quite a few myself. But I always thought that was just a way of speaking, a kindly lie, some Christian's pious pat on the back to cheer me on. And there's the difference between the real believers and the nominal Christians that abound in our churches across the land. No one can measure like a believer the depth and the intensity of God's love, but at the same time, no one can measure like a believer the effectiveness of our gloom, pessimism, low self-esteem, self-hatred, and despair that block God's way to us. Do you see why it is so important to lay hold of this basic truth of our faith? Because you're only gonna be as big as your own concept of God. Remember the famous line of the French philosopher, Blaise Pascal? God made man in his own image, and man returned the compliment. We often make God in our own image. He won't have to be as fussy, rude, narrow-minded, legalistic, judgmental, unforgiving, unloving as we are. In the past couple of three years, I have preached the gospel to the financial community in Wall Street, New York City, the airmen and women of the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, a thousand physicians in Nairobi. I've been in churches in Bangor, Maine, Miami, Chicago, St. Louis, Seattle, San Diego, and honest, the God of so many Christians I meet is a God who is too small for me because he is not the God of the Word, he is not the God revealed by and in Jesus Christ, who this moment comes right to your seat and says, I have a word for you. I know your whole life story. I know every skeleton in your closet. Listen. I know every moment of sin, shame, dishonesty, and degraded love that has darkened your past. Right now, I know your shallow faith, your feeble prayer life, your inconsistent discipleship. And my word is this. I dare you to trust that I love you just as you are and not as you should be because you're never gonna be as you should be. I dare you to trust that Abba loves you right this minute just as you are, not as you should be. I hope you heard him say this. I dare you to love I dare you to accept the love of Christ who takes you just as you are, not as you think you should be, because you will never be as you think you should be. Because we're human. Because the enemy will always keep moving the bar. I challenge you. I challenge you. Accept this word today. Abba loves you just like you are will you this morning give up your legalistic view of God will this, you this morning be willing to sacrifice the weight and the burden of salvation by works and not just by a father who loves you are you willing to give all of that up that you might just know him that you might just know him if you're willing I want you to get up from where you are. I want you to come find a place to kneel. And I want you to say, Father, I repent of only knowing you at a distance. I repent of knowing you by works. I repent. Father, I accept your love today because you're Abba. Come on. Come quickly. 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 
Come on, find a place to play. Turn me on some music back there, please. Come on, quickly. 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 Come find a place to play. Neil. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is a transformational day. This will change your life forever. This makes a difference forever. This will change every scripture you read. This will change every thought you have about God. This will change every minute of your life. This will change everything. When